Hello and welcome to our continuing series of Central Region Science Sharing uh, webinars. Uh, today uh, our speaker will be Barb Mays Boosted from the National Weather Service in Omaha Valley, Nebraska and also at the School of Natural Resources, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her co-authors are Steve Hilberg with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center and Martha Shilsky and Ken Hubbard at the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Her topic will be the Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index, or AWSSI. So without further ado, Barb, it's all yours. And at the end, or along the way, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, please just speak up. OK, thanks, John. Um, again, this is Barb May Salstead. And uh, I want to take a minute to acknowledge my co-authors. I know John just read their names, but uh, Steve Hilberg has been really instrumental in making this index come together and has put a lot of work into it. And also, uh, Martha Shulsky and Ken Hubbard are my advisors at University of Nebraska. This work has been supported by the University Assignment Program, so I also want to thank Central Region and my own office for their support uh, in this uh, dissertation work. And what I'm going to present is a pretty big piece of the dissertation work that I've been doing over the last few years at University of Nebraska. Um, so the presentation is an Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index, or for short, OSSI. Um, we have indexes for a lot of things in weather and climate. We have indices for drought, for tornado severity, hurricanes, just about everything you can think of. But we don't have one for season severity. One of the reasons we need a winter scale to begin with, um, when you ask somebody what a bad winter is or what a severe winter is, they may have different definitions or what a good winter is. So for example, on the left, me in short, that's my definition of a good winter. Uh, Steve Hilberg on the right, uh, this is actually almost a good winter for him. He just wishes there was a little more snow. Uh, Steve and I got to talking about how we had an interest in doing this project and put our heads together to come up with uh, an index that would quantify winter season severity so that we can use it to describe winters a little more objectively. So there are a few goals. If anybody here has heard me talk, you've probably heard me talk about Laura Ingalls Wilder and Little House on the Prairie books. Um, so part of my need for a winter season scale is so that I can put some historical winters into a context. For me, that's the long winter of 1880 to 81. But there are certainly other winters of interest out there that someone might want to try to discuss the severity of. Some of those winters in the 70s come to mind. And, and also the mild outliers, you know, putting in context a winter like the one we had of 2011 to 12. Um, you know, to be able to talk about how that's a record mild winter, well, we have to define what that mild winter means, too. Um, we also can use this to put not just historical winters, but the current winter in the context. Uh, what is this winter most like? Uh, is this a bad winter or an easy winter compared to the record? How does our winter here in Omaha compare to, say, Des Moines winter so far this year? We can use a scale to assess climate variability and change, looking at things like ENSO scales, NAO, pick your favorite uh, teleconnection alphabet soup. Um, this is a way to have a quantity that we can look at climate variability against. And we can also look at trends at this scale. And finally, to make an index that's usable, that describes the severity, um, and that gives us a basis to talk about the impacts and applications. So here are a few of our goals as we put together this Aussie. We wanted it to be an objective index that used weather parameters. We had some discussion about whether it should include impact-based or subjective information. Um, but when it came down to it, you know, that stuff is really difficult to quantify. It's very difficult to even create a database, let alone to keep one up in the future. Uh, and it's subjective. Uh, an impact that might seem important to me and Steve, you know, might not be that important to another audience. And something we didn't think of might be crucially important somewhere else. So rather than try and get into the messiness of subjective uh, indices or impacts, we decided to create this objective index. And then that can be used as a scale, as a basis for comparison for those, objective, or for those subjective impacts that come up later. We wanted to use widely available data, the kind of stuff you can download really quickly on XMASIS. So we based it on daily temperature, snowfall, and snow depth. We're also working on a parallel index that, instead of snowfall and snow depth, uses precipitation. Because I'm probably not going to surprise anybody by saying our snow records aren't the most reliable that we have. Um, 
We also wanted to uh, use this widely available data so that you can create an Aussie database at a lot of different sites, as long as they have these few parameters in their records. So this could be done at co-op sites, ASOS, first order stations, um, as well as any other historical observations you can dig up. We wanted a value that accumulates as the season progresses. It's kind of like keeping a score. We want the score to get bigger the more severe the winter is so that we can, uh, we can develop an average of what winters are. We can develop a record of the, the highs and lows, top fives, bottom fives, and show the progress of severity through a season. We're always marching upward toward a final value. And that final value itself can be representative of the total severity of the season. And by doing this, it allows us to compare. Uh, we can compare at one site, let's say Omaha, we can compare seasons um, among each other, find similar seasons find uh, ones that were also affected by El Nino, for example. Or we can also compare site to site. We can look at the uh, absolute values of our Aussie score here in Omaha and compare it to, say, Minneapolis-St. Paul and feel pretty good about ourselves. Or we can compare, uh, we can normalize it, that is, uh, basically divide the index by the average at the site, and compare how much of an outlier a site is for any given year. So for example, the winter of 2011 and 12 was pretty mild. You know, was it as much of a mild winter here in Omaha as it was in, say, Chicago? Well, we can use this index to figure that kind of question out. And because it is pretty uh, baseline and uses this objective meteorological data, it can be applied to multiple users and their needs. For example, uh, road crews or plowing companies might know that when Aussie reaches a certain threshold, their costs go way up. They've uh, had to put in a lot of overtime or get extra supplies mid-season, for example. And maybe uh, anticipating when these seasons are coming might help them offset some of those costs. That's just one example. Well, in order to define uh, the severity of a winter, we had to first define what winter is, how it begins and how it ends. And uh, we surveyed some of our colleagues, and we actually did a, also an informal Facebook poll and found that, boy, everybody defines winter just a little bit differently. And it only has a little bit to do with where people live. Uh, we heard different definitions, some of them very calendar-based. You know, the winter always starts on December 1st, or it starts the weekend after Thanksgiving. It starts on the winter solstice. We also heard some meteorological factors. Um, winter starts at the first snowfall, or the first time the snow lays on the ground and sticks. And we heard very subjective definitions of what makes a winter begin. Uh, it's the first time I have to put my coat on, or it's the first time that my car slides in the driveway. So putting all of this together, we did want to get away from just a strict calendar-based definition, because part of what defines the severity of a winter is occasionally how long it is. So we've established uh, just a few criteria that trigger the beginning of winter. When the first of these things happens, that means winter has begun. So the first time that the temperature does not rise above freezing during the day, the first measurable snowfall, or if these haven't happened by then, then we'll fall back to the calendar and say, OK, then it begins on December 1st. The flip side of these is how we have decided to end the winter accumulation. The accumulation will stop after the last of these things occurs, either the max temperature staying below freezing, Snowfall, the last measurable snowfall. We also included a snow depth measurement because sometimes that snow sticks on the ground quite a ways after the last snowfall or the last freezing temperature. Or um, if all of these things are already done, then winter ends on March 1st, if none of that stuff ever happens again for the rest of the spring. Now we have to talk about how we're going to accumulate points or a score. And um, this is a, a long table. I know it's going to take a while for your eyes to absorb all of this, but let me just break down a bit of it. What we've done is develop thresholds. And for a certain temperature range, for example, a threshold uh, of a point will accumulate. So if, for example, the maximum temperature today was 30 and the minimum temperature was 15, uh, with a maximum temperature of 30, we're going to accumulate in this threshold for one point. Minimum temperature of 15, we're going to accumulate in this threshold for three points. So that would be four total points just for the temperature. Let's say we also had 1.5 inches of snow. Uh, we would accumulate two points here for the snowfall in this range. 
And then if that left us with a two-inch snow depth, we'd also accumulate another two points. That's four points for the temperature, four points for snowfall and snow depth, eight points total accumulating for the day. And each day, we go through the observations and accumulate points using this chart. Um, so a couple of things to uh, point out about it. It is a little arbitrary. You know, there was no magic number that said, you know, there's a reason why the temperature had to split at 5 to 9 degrees instead of 5 to 10 degrees, except that we were trying to be kind of nice and round and even in our numbers. Uh, one of the things that was at least a little less arbitrary is with snowfall. Uh, very often, snowfall happens over the break of a day, uh, at least in the observation sense. So what might be a six inch snowfall might have fallen two inches on one day, four inches on the other day. So if that happens, you're going to get a, a three point score for the two inches, a six point score for the four inches. That gives you nine total points for that six inch snowfall. We wanted to make sure that that was the same as getting those six inches all in one day. So if you go through, the snowfall amounts should be additive. And this is how we score all the way through the winter season. Now, there are some things that are not explicitly included in the OSI. This is a weakness of it. Uh, first of all, freezing rain is not included. Freezing rain is not explicitly measured and archived. In fact, uh, climatologies of freezing rain are kind of hard to come by and are usually limited in both space and the time that they cover. Um, the same goes for sort of mixed winter precip. Yeah, if it fell as a rain-snow mix, you're going to pick up some snowfall accumulation there, but it's probably a, not very much of an amount and probably not really representative of the impact that it had. So that's a weakness of this snowfall version. Now, when we go to uh, create an index where we calculate uh, basically a proxy of snowfall based on the precipitation amount and temperature, that's actually going to give us some hits on uh, precipitation events that fell in a mixed phase. So that might actually make this a little better. Another thing that's not explicitly included is wind. And I know wind is a big deal. It can really make a winter feel miserable when it comes to both wind chill and blowing snow. Um, but we just don't have the daily data records easily attainable to get that kind of data quickly. It's something we could go back and tweak later if we wanted to really make a detailed daily index. But for now, at least, we've left it out. And there's no way for us to uh, accommodate visibilities either, so blowing snow, freezing fog, neither of those are going to be included in here. So in other words, Aussie doesn't incorporate every possible stinky winter element that we can get. But it does get some of the big stuff. And it gets the sense of the severity of the winter, we believe. So just to show some examples, I'm going to start with a single site analysis. And of course, since I live in Omaha, it was uh, probably the easiest one for me to grab and analyze. So this is going to be a closer look at Aussie for Omaha. Here's a pretty busy chart, but let me break it down for you. This is looking at this, uh, September 1st all the way through May 31st. And each line represents the accumulation through one winter. The thick black line in the middle represents the average over the whole period, 1951 to 2013. And the thick dashed lines on either side are plus and minus one standard deviation. So Omaha's average Aussie in that period is 606. Our plus and minus one standard deviations are 434 to 777. That means about two-thirds of our winters are captured in that range. Our minimum is 290, and our maximum is 1052. So that's the range of experience, at least in that period of record. A lot of numbers, and by themselves, don't necessarily mean too much until you start to compare them or compare individual years to those averages. So let's pull apart here just the highest five and lowest five years in Omaha's record. And I've left the average line on there for reference. Omaha's worst winter was the winter of 1959 to 60. Um, not too many people in our office now were around then. But a lot of us were around for the second worst winter on record, which is the winter of 2009 to 10. Um, that winter, if you'll notice, accumulated pretty quickly here in the December and early January. We got a lot of snow and some cold temperatures early in the winter and then actually leveled off uh, toward the end of winter and into the spring months. Every winter kind of behaves different, has a certain character to it. And the line, that, the shape of the line helps describe that. On the mild side for us, the mildest winter on record was the winter of 1999 to 2000. Uh, it was not only mild for us, it was very dry, as were these, some of these other mild, low-ranking winters. 
Um, our most recent mild winter is, of course, uh, 2011 to 12, which is the fourth mildest for us here on record. Now we can break this Aussie apart uh, from the total accumulation into its temperature and snow components. So this is just the winter of 2009 to 10. Remember, that was a pretty severe one for us. And the solid line is that winter. The dashed red line is the average for the total Aussie. And I've broken it down into the temperature, which is this blue line here, and snow, the green line, components for that winter. And you can see in particular the snow accumulation, the green solid line, is much higher than our average snow accumulation, which is way down here in the dashed line. In fact, for Omaha at least, um, our temperature portion of the accumulation uh, it has some variability year to year, but not nearly as much as the snowfall accumulation. And all of our most severe winters on record also had a pretty high uh, snowfall accumulation compared to normal. So what kind of information does that give me here in Omaha? Well, our toughest winters here are usually our snowy ones. Um, if we don't get a lot of snow here, the accumulation isn't going to amount to much, and it tends to be correlated with uh, some milder weather as well which makes sense for us here. If we don't have snowpack, our temperatures can get pretty mild like we're seeing today. So just some stats for Omaha. Um, this is stuff I gave to us here in our winter weather seminar uh, earlier this winter. Uh, I mentioned our average is 606. The temperature component is about 80% uh, of that, 421, or snow component, 184. Our average start date to the winter is November 15th. In other words, we usually do kick off our winters earlier than that December 1st cutoff. Our very earliest was October 9th. Um, but eight times in our record, uh, we did not have winter conditions before December 1st, so the accumulation started then. Our average end date is April 1st. That means we typically have wintry type conditions carrying on well into March, at least. Um, the earliest cutoff on record for us is February 28th. That is, nothing wintry happened after the end of calendar winter. That happened a couple of times. There's also a February 29th or two that snuck in there. Uh, the latest cutoff we had is May 3rd, 1967, which came very close to being tied just this past year. So in total, our average length of winter in Omaha is 138 days. Our shortest winter was that uh, winter of 99 to 2000, just 91 days. That's the bare minimum you can get for a winter. Our longest winter, 1991 to 92, 176 days. And believe it or not, I'm not showing this, the length of a winter is not very well correlated with the severity of the winter. Now, we've run this kind of analysis for several sites around the region and, and around the country. So let me show you some of the information we can gather just uh, looking at those in comparison to each other. This map here kind of busy, but these are all the sites that we've run so far. Um, you can see we've got a heavy concentration in the north central United States. That's a research interest area for me and uh, an area of interest for Steve Hilberg at the Midwest Regional Climate Center and my advisors at the High Plains Climate Center. We are also trying to get some sites that are a little bit or a lot outside of a usual winter climatology. Because one thing we do believe is that this should work in just about every winter climatology that's out there. The only one we think it won't work well in is year-round winter, so places that carry a snowpack all through the winter or where temperatures can stay below freezing all through the summer. Um, but sites like uh, Atlanta or some places in Texas, for example, that get a mild winter, this should still work because it's still going to accumulate points through the winter season. and. Um, you can also normalize those and look at relative severity, which is probably pretty important for some of those regions. So this is still an expanding list. Uh, we just got data in for Boston just the other day, in fact. So we're working on expanding this. An even busier map now, so let's break this one down. Um, this is all of the years 1951 to 2013 for all of the sites that we have run the Aussie so far. Lots of squiggly lines. Um, along the right, the, in the small letters, those are ranked from average most severe to average least severe. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone if I tell you that the most severe site we've looked at so far is International Falls, followed by Duluth and Fargo. Um, on the mild side, I don't think it'll surprise anybody if I say Atlanta is the most mild site we've looked at, followed by St. Louis and Dodge City. 
Um, I do have to admit that I uh, was a little bit surprised at some of these results. For example, Omaha has more severe winters on average than Detroit, which makes me think uh, my relocation from Michigan to Nebraska was ill-advised. Um, now, you can look at these together and see some behaviors are common. For example, this winter of 2011 to 12 really stands out as mild everywhere. Everybody took a dip that winter. Some of these in the 70s stand out as pretty severe, a lot of upticks here in the 70s as well. And in some years, the, the sites don't behave a lot like each other. Some years, there's some, some spread among them and a lot of squiggly lines going in a lot of different directions. And that means there was probably quite a bit of regional variability. So this is looking at the total Aussie. Um, now we're going to normalize this, which again, we're dividing each site by its own average to look for big outliers. And all of a sudden, this late 70s really stands out for the mild sites on the record, uh, Atlanta, St. Louis. Because these sites are so mild, when they get some kind of a wintry spell, it really stands out in their record. So the deviations get really strong. Uh, we're looking at two or three times normal there. Now the more severe sites are the ones uh, that are harder to deviate from their climatology because they're already pretty bad to begin with. The outliers just don't lie out that much. So you don't see them standing out quite as strongly. But what this does let you see is, again, when these winters are uh, perhaps very severe everywhere, perhaps very mild everywhere, or it can let you look at regional patterns, which sites are, are behaving like each other or different from each other. Now for me, um, being a meteorologist, I like to look at things in a map view. So I'm going to look at two winters here, recent winters, one of them a fairly severe example, one of them a fairly mild example. So on the left, we're looking at the Aussie values for the winter of 2009 to 10. Uh, some of the information you can gather from this map. Okay, uh, Des Moines has an Aussie of 1178 for that winter, Minneapolis, St. Paul, 1160, which means Des Moines winter was just a little bit more severe that year than Minneapolis, St. Paul's. Probably not very common, but we can see how un uncommon that is in a bit. Uh, you can also see these regional patterns. In the red are sites where the uh, result was below average, so a mild winter. In the blue, the results are above average or a severe winter. Um, it wasn't quite universally bad everywhere in 2009 to 10, but certainly the Plains and Midwest, Corn Belt, took a, hard, took a hard hit that winter. By contrast, the winter of 2011 to 12 uh, was mild just about everywhere, with Denver being the lone and weird exception. Um, all of these sites with asterisks next to them are the record mildest for that site. So several sites had their record mildest winter just a couple of winters ago. Uh, and for someone who uh, gets a 443 in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that's looking pretty good. But Atlanta at 21, boy, that's a mild winter. You've barely accumulated any points in that winter, barely got below freezing, in other words. Now we've looked at this in the absolute values, but let's look at the normalized values to give you a sense of how relatively mild or severe these sites were. So again, looking on the left-hand side, 2009 to 10, uh, remember I told you that Des Moines and Minneapolis-St. Paul had just about the same Aussie, but you can see uh, Des Moines for that winter was quite a bit above its average, and Minneapolis-St. Paul was very near its average, just slightly above its average for that winter. So that explains why Des Moines' value could catch up to Minneapolis-St. Paul. Um, on the other side here, on the warm side, you can see several of these sites were uh, maybe a third to a half as severe as normal. A very mild winter across the board in those locations. And the one site that was more severe than normal was barely, barely so. Um, another way to look at these uh, data, especially looking at them as a group, is to look at their box and whiskers. So um, the shaded area is the middle 25th to 75th percentile. The upper and lower dots are the max and minimum for that site. And then the line in the middle is the median. So for example, you can see, here we go, Cheyenne and Milwaukee have a pretty similar median, but Milwaukee's spread is quite a bit wider. Um, similarly, Des Moines and North Platte have a pretty similar median, but Des Moines has a wider spread. That's actually something I noticed for the mountain and high plains sites in general, they had a, a lot less spread than the sites that are further out into the plains and Midwest. So um, 
maybe in those mountain or near mountain climatologies, they just tend to get those snows one way or the other. I don't know. Uh, it's also interesting to look at, for example, the very mildest winter in International Falls is uh, still about the same as the median in, say, Huron, South Dakota. Um, let's appreciate the severity of winter at some other locations or appreciate the mildness of winter at some locations in comparison. I don't know, maybe some chambers of commerce would want to get their hands on this kind of stuff. So I mentioned um, looking at, at Aussie but without the snowfall data. It's pretty important for our research to be able to go back into historical records and still be able to determine the severity of a winter season. And uh, we don't always have to snowfall data for that. Um, in many locations, snowfall data doesn't go past the mid-20th century. Um, some locations you can get back toward 1900 or so, but the reliability of that data is questionable, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, snowfall measurement practices have changed quite a bit through time. Um, there have been a lot of periods where 10 to 1 was the normal, where snow was measured uh, with different techniques of clearing the board or not clearing the board. Um, it was measured with different wind equipment or not. And um, just overall, that record can be filled with a lot of holes. And that doesn't even address the missing data of the mid to late 1990s and some other issues that we have. So we wanted to be able to create this index so that it can also work for historical analysis without using snowfall or snow depth data. And the way to do this is to come up with a calculation that uses only surface temperature and precipitation amount to do a snowfall approximation or a proxy. So this is our justification of why. We want to be able to examine these historical records. Um, we also want to remove some of the uncertainty with snow measurements. It, you know, we're treating this Aussie with snow like it's our baseline, but at the same time, um, using snowfall measurements in it may actually introduce more mistakes than just using the precipitation total, which is at least often a more reliable data set. And uh, as I mentioned back in the weaknesses of this study, we might even be able to account for some of these near freezing precipitation events that didn't get recorded as snow or as much snow, but also had pretty significant impacts. So here's the technique that we've used. It's based on a preprint, actually, from a climate conference a few years back. And we are still tweaking and playing with our formulas. This isn't set in stone yet. Um, but so far, what we did was uh, use this technique to divide up the record into light, moderate, and heavy precipitation totals, and then cold and mild events. And then there was basically an empirical formula that we could plug the numbers into um, to come out with a calculation of approximate snowfall amount. We found that it worked really well in cold climates. It was actually calibrated for Minneapolis-St. Paul, so it works really well in that kind of climatology. It worked OK in Omaha, too. Um, we're not sure so much about the results in the more mild climates, like, say, central Illinois, where Steve is located. Um, it might be that it's actually working well there, and we're capturing some of those events that we couldn't capture before. But we're not really confident yet. So we're still working on this part, still looking for ways to solve this problem. Uh, in addition to calculating some kind of snowfall approximation, we also have to calculate some kind of snow depth approximation. Uh, it seems pretty simple. Snow depth should be taking what we had yesterday, adding the snowfall for today. But you also have to factor in compaction and melting, which gets a little more complicated. Um, I started with a formula based on the Iowa Mesonet Meteograms page, as many of you probably have seen. Um, but again, still tweaking and trying to work on this. There might be some other ways to decay this a little more accurately. Right now, it seems like we eat our snowpack away a little bit too quickly. So we're still trying to make this work, too. But with what we have, um, we've come up with a pretty good fit here for Omaha. Um, between the two samples, uh, OBS is the Aussie version with snowfall calculated is the Aussie version with precipitation calculating it. Um, the means and the variances in these are not significantly different. The R squared, 0.88, not too bad. Probably a pretty acceptable approximation. You, you'll notice a couple years where uh, one value doesn't quite match up to the other one exactly, but it feels like we're doing pretty well here. And we're at least representing the character of the winter, if not exactly matching the Aussie. Um, Looking at Urbana, actually, the R squared was a little higher, but the uh, variances and the means were both significantly different between the two samples. So um, 
it may not be an acceptable approximation yet. But it's getting very close, and we think this will be useful for going back to, say, the winter of 1880 to 81, and using just precipitation and temperature records, trying to figure out if the long winter really was the worst winter on record. So uh, other than that application, here are a few that we've come up with so far for using this kind of data. The first one here I'm going to show you is a live season tracking that we're doing here in Omaha. I mentioned that I presented this at our winter weather seminar. And when I did, I had everybody guess what they thought the Aussie would be by the end of our winter season this year. So I'm also tracking our current season. That's the bright red line. And you can see some uh, other values on there. I put the average. I put the last five years, and then the maximum and minimum. And the dashed lines, of course, being all of our guesses. The gray envelope is the plus and minus one standard deviation. So you can see, for example, this winter in Omaha is tracking a bit above average, not quite outside that standard deviation envelope, but uh, certainly above average. And if I broke this down into temperature and precipitation components, you would see that virtually all of the accumulation has come from temperatures, because we're in a bit of a snow drought here. We've only had about 4.7 inches of snow so far this winter, which is well below normal for us. So we can use this to gauge the severity of our winter to date. We can rank it season to date. I just looked it up today, and we're in the top 25 of winter seasons to date. We can also project the future Aussie based on uh, our coming forecast. I literally could plug in our day one to seven point based forecast for Omaha and forecast what our Aussie is going to be at the end of seven days. Uh, and doing that here, I would find it's not going to increase by much, and we're going to slip out of that top 25 to more like the top 30 or 35. You can also go even further. The Climate Forecast System, or CFS, is projected out for four weeks or so, maybe longer, um, and create an ensemble of possibilities, maybe an envelope of possible Aussies by the end of the CFS run period. Um, again, those of you who have heard me talk before probably know that I basically like to take just about anything and compare it to ENSO and NAO. So why not try it with Aussie and see what happens? On the left side here, you'll see that I've compared the December, January, February ENSO analysis with Aussie at Minneapolis-St. Paul. And what we can say from this graph is that uh, when a La Nina is present, there is a greater than usual chance for the Aussie to be on the high or severe side a lower than usual chance for the Aussie to be on the low or mild side. And then on the right side, if you look at January, February, March, El Nino and La Nina composite, still from Minneapolis, St. Paul, you'll also notice that in an El Nino, it's uh, less likely than usual to have a severe Aussie or a high Aussie account. Um, these kinds of analyses are possible at every site we run this at. Some will have significant values and some won't, but we can at least see if there's a way to break these down. And we can also look at the individual components, temperature and snowfall. I didn't specifically look for this presentation, but it's entirely possible that all of the signal that we're seeing is coming just from the temperature component, and that the relationship would be even stronger if we kicked out the snowfall side, or vice versa. We can also look at NAO. And uh, negative NAO, we tend to not see mild winters at Omaha. Positive NAO, we tend to see a better chance for mild winters in Omaha. Again, not surprising based on uh, some other analyses we've run here already, but confirms what we know and is another way to look at the index and use the index to provide information. Um, another graph here that's a little on the busy side, I've taken four sites, Fargo, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Des Moines, and Omaha, and I've broken them just into the first and second half of their records to see if there are any differences or trends between those first and second halves. And uh, at each one of those sites, you can see that the median value has decreased. So winters are milder in the second half of the record than they are in the first half of the record. You can also see that the median in Fargo now is a little bit like the median in Minneapolis-St. Paul used to be back in the day. Ditto for Des Moines and Omaha. Median in, Omaha, in uh, Des Moines now is a little bit like the median in Omaha used to be back in the day. Um, I've run a few other trend analyses. Uh, just about every site I've analyzed, at the very least, the temperature component has a uh, downward trend, and in most cases, a significant downward trend. Snow is a little more variable. Um, 
I, I haven't really tried to look at it uh, holistically for a rhyme or reason, but definitely there are some sites where snowfall is trending upward and others where snowfall is trending downward. So the overall Aussie is trending downward for the most part in most sites. Temperature component of it, definitely trending down. One last possible application, and this is more on the user side, maybe something that our state climatologists, for example, can take the Aussie to help some customers with. Let's say there's a customer out there that uh, has some kind of critical thing that happens when Aussie reaches 700. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, maybe the cost increases for that decision maker. It could be road treatment, it could be school closures, you know, whatever. Um, in Omaha, that's happened out of that's happened uh, 17 out of our 61 winters. Now let's say if this customer knows that there's a chance that our Aussie is going to reach 700 by January 15th, they can do something to offset that cost. They can make some kind of purchase or cancel some kind of contract or something that helps them out. Well, I can tell them that when the Aussie is at 350 or better or greater on January 15th, um, 10 of those years have gone on, 10 of those 16 years have gone on to exceed 700. Well, that's a probability of detection of 60%, a false alarm rate of about 38%. You know, that's getting to be about as good as some of our convective warnings that we ask people to take action on. So maybe for that customer, that's enough confidence to take that kind of action. Maybe it's not. Maybe they want to go to a, a higher threshold where there's a better chance of, of capturing it. Um, in any case, this is just a possible application where someone can take this meteorologically based index and apply it to something that's subjective and impact based to help some customer make a decision. There is still quite a bit of additional work. Uh, we're getting pretty close with this to completion, <clears throat> but we need to complete working on this temperature and precipitation version. We're just tweaking things around a little bit before we run our sites with it. Um, we also have started to break down the analysis to temperature and snowfall or precipitation only components. Um, once we do that, we'll want to run some of these ENSO composites and some other things just to see how the trends play out and see how the teleconnections play out. Um, we're just about to winding down on adding more sites, but we are planning on adding a few more at least. Just a few more from around the plains, but mostly right now, I think, uh, to get to some of these other climate regimes so that we see how they compare. And then finally, you know, Steve has done a wonderful job running these uh, through a program he's written back at the Midwest Regional Climate Center. But we want this kind of information to be easily accessible, just as easy as going into um, Eximasis or LCAT, so that anybody, wherever you are, can go look up what your Aussie is, get your curve to date for this winter, get your averages for your normal winters, for example. So we're hoping to find a home for this permanently. We're thinking maybe LCAT might be a fit, but we're still working that out. And then hopefully everybody will have access to this. So in summary, uh, some of the benefits of the Aussie are that it is calculated using widely available data. It allows analysis of winters, um, especially in the central plains, but really in many climate regimes. And it should have broad applications, everything from analyzing past winters and describing them to giving a state of the winter update and maybe even predictive capabilities. And it should have applications to multiple sectors and many users. You know, this should help you answer your media's questions about how bad is this winter just as easily as answering, answering a, a really in-depth inquiry about um, what severity of winters cost uh, schools more than a certain amount because of shutdowns. The limitations, this doesn't include wind, so no wind chill, no blowing snow. It doesn't include mix, mixed precipitation or freezing rain explicitly, although the precipitation only version might help with that. And the thresholds are set with impacts in mind, but they are still kind of arbitrary. Um, the good thing about thresholds is that they're forgiving. So the index should be able to use um, your actual data that you pull off of Eximasis or homogenized data. Um, it really shouldn't matter because you know the homogenized data I don't think make big changes most of the time. It probably will be absorbed within the amount of a threshold in most cases. So with that, um, I am happy to take any questions or uh, your thoughts and ideas, potential applications, anything you might want to know. Um, if you're curious about your own site, and it was one of those, 
one of the ones on the map, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to talk it over with you and send you the data that I have. And uh, for those of you who are listening to this as a recorded version later, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me on email if you have questions as well. And with that, uh, I'm going to get through the rest of the winter and Steve is going to celebrate the rest of this winter. He's super excited because it's been a high Aussie winter for him. So um, I, with that, I can take any questions and uh, thanks for your time. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Barb. This is Richard Hyman at NCDC. This is an excellent presentation. I very much like what you've done here, and I can see great applications to it. I do have a question concerning one of the slides. It is the multi-site NAWSSI 1951-2013 normalized AWSSI time series. And one thing that really jumped out at me is the consistency between the stations for a number of decades, but there are a couple decades, that one, a couple decades that really jump out as not showing much spatial consistency. The uh, 2000s, first decade of the 2000s, and the 1960s, I guess the late 50s, early 60s, and then the late 60s, early 70s. Um, that is very interesting. Would you like to comment on that? Well, golly, you're right. That is very interesting. Um, it would be interesting to go through some uh, uh, some work to see what the patterns were at the time and what the dominant teleconnection features were during those couple of periods. Um, it would also be interesting to break these into uh, smaller regional segments and see if, for example, the Great Lakes are behaving consistently with each other and the Plains are behaving consistently with each other, but the two are not behaving as a group consistently with each other. Um, but that's a really good insight. Thank you very much. Hey, Barb. Yeah. This is Todd up in Sioux Falls. Question for you. Uh, you, you mentioned it early on in the presentation that you grabbed these values uh, kind of arbitrarily as far as the temperature ranges and that. Have you really tested it if you changed the temperature values or the ranges one or two degrees and how that would affect your uh, end result as far as the values are concerned. It kind of concerns me a little bit that it was just kind of arbitrarily decided on. Yeah, um, you know, early in the process we did a little bit of sensitivity testing and tested um, with a couple of the more extreme locations. Uh, International Falls was our cold site and I think we used Champaign for our warm site. Um, we did do a little bit of sensitivity testing. It didn't seem to affect things too greatly. Uh, Barb, can you hear me? Yes, Marina, hi. Uh, hi, good presentation. Um, you know, I have a question, of course, about the trends. Uh, you know, you definitely show that there is a trend, but did you, when you analyze relationship to ANSO, did you try to do the trend adjustment? No, we did not use a trend adjustment when using the ANSO analysis. But that is a good point. And you know what, Marina, would be great? is if this is an LCAT, that system would be worked out for us. I hear you. That's why, you know, I'm looking at the different pilot studies just to make sure that, you know, there is a valid methodology behind. So, you know, I would like to talk more with you about this. And uh, another question I have, uh, you start with the daily data, right? Um, Correct. To get um, the um, onset of the index, uh, do you think is this, uh, maybe we should start not with LCAT actually, but with Examasis because they will be doing this data mining section and then it will go to LCAT for analytical capabilities. Do you see what I try to say? I do see what you're saying and I can see a role for, for both, for uh, having it in Examasis as another feature of data mining and for having it in LCAT to do variability and trend analyses. I think this would be uh, this would be much easier path. Yep, we should definitely talk about that then. Okay. Uh, Barb, this is John. I have a question. Um, I don't know if you've spoken with or you've worked with, and you may have already. Um, that I noticed that uh, NCDC has this regional snow index. Is there any? 
which they try to get impacts. Have you thought about how some of their work may be useful to what you've done, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but um, just just something I was just wondering about because I was familiar with it. Yeah, um, I've had good conversations with, I believe it's Michael Squires at NCDC who's doing mm -hmm. that work. Right. And, um, you know, his goals are a little different than ours. His goals are to gather impacts of snow events and spatially, where ours are to look at the severity of a winter season as a whole in a point-based scenario. Um, so they almost go together, but um, they kind of support each other but don't really mesh together. But um, you know, putting together his information with mine would really help tell the complete story of a historical winter uh, by using the threat of Aussie to show the severity as it accumulates, but also his collection, uh, his database, to talk about specific events within that winter. And I think the biggest difference is that ultimately our outcome is to have a value at the end of winter that describes how bad that winter was. And um, his index doesn't necessarily include every snow event. Yeah, Barb, this is Richard again. Uh, along that line of thinking, have you considered doing some kind of spatial integration of the station Aussies to get a measure of the spatial severity extent, spatial extent of the severity of winter across the country or a region? Yeah, in fact, um, once we do get this in a place that's a little more automated and less labor intensive, I'd like to see it even possibly being gridded, where you could come up with a climatology and a deviation from climatology and uh, look at the spatial extent of uh, severe, severe impacts or severe winter seasons, for example. Any other questions for Barb? If you're chewing on something but don't quite have uh, it articulated yet, then don't hesitate to email me later. I'd love to answer. Barb? Yeah. yeah this, this is Steve uh, Hilbert. Um, I was just going to comment on R Richard's earlier observation about the differences on the net normalized chart. Uh, <clears throat> some of that might be due to the uh, um, let's say the, over, the preponderance of temperature over snowfall or vice versa in a region versus, um, versus other regions. So the difference could be uh, temperature or snowfall related in some of those that's not clear from the total index. Yeah, Steve, another idea that was popping in, into my head as I was looking at that time series is uh, related to fluctuations in climate, climate variability and, and maybe climate change. The 1960s were characterized by a lot of snowstorms, as I'm trying to recall from the uh, Nestis snow cover maps that I looked at in the 60s, of the 60s. And then we had more consistent patterns, uh, possibly in, in the 80s and 90s, and, and perhaps we're going into a, a period of more variability of climate. Uh, it, it was basically the, the thoughts are along the lines of how can this index be used to, to measure climate variability? Yeah, and I, I think there's, a, as Barb pointed, I think there's a good opportunity for that. Hey, Barb, this is Pat at Paducah. Uh, I assume that you have some kind of a computer program that you're running all this through to create the indices? Uh, to give proper and full credit, Steve has a computer program that he's running, <laughs> yes, and uh, then we do some post-processing in Excel. Okay. Um, how hard is, would it be to, to port that? I mean, I'd love to do something like that locally here, but, you know, it's probably something you're not interested in is what the winner is at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. What I'm hoping is ultimately this is going to be put on someplace central where everybody can do their own analyses if they want to. Um, this is the discussion with Marina and I to hopefully get it worked into um, maybe LCAT or maybe Eximasis or maybe both. In the meantime, if you have a site you're interested in, you know, it wouldn't pain us to run a site or two at least. No, it's, pre it's a pretty, pretty, once we get the data, it's a pretty simple job. Okay, I might do that. Thank you. And I'd be happy to step through with you, you know, what the analysis looks like in the spreadsheets and things like that, too. So just get in touch with me. 
Okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, Barb, I also uh, <clears throat> was aware that uh, the ACES database or this whole database system does have some APIs and ways to actually call the data in, in real, you know, in real time, as it were, if you were calculating it. Barb, this is uh, J.P. Martin, the WCM in Bismarck, and I'm having a, a tough time right now because I'm trying to decide if I if I completely oppose uh, every finding you have because Bismarck is not number one on your <laughs> list, or, or if I completely support it because Bismarck is not number one. So maybe you can help me with that at some point. You should take a staff vote, and maybe you should take it both at the beginning and the end of winter. Okay, we'll, we'll work on that. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> JP, this is Jim in Omaha. We'll happily give you that number one if we can do that some way. Hey, I was going to comment that uh, you know our winters here. Of course, yeah, you live through some mild ones up here, so I'm not sure they count. Uh, very true. Hey, I just wanted to thank Barb, too. Uh, thanks, Barb, because I know you uh, coming off your cold and everything again. Uh, and just my comment very quickly is uh, I, I'm – just kind of more excited and looking forward to how, um, you know, we can kind of figure out how to, to apply it and use some of the applications. And, uh, and and I think that's just going to take some time to work out, but I already like some of the things Barb's proposed with it. So we're, we're looking forward to uh, kind of watching it grow here and, and see where it takes off to. So thanks again, Barb. Thanks, Jim.